Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Rebecca Villagran and I serve as Vice Chair of the Alamo Management Committee and Tri-Chair of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. In 2014, the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee created the vision and guiding principles that serve as the foundation for the Alamo Plan. In the summer of 2021, we hosted seven content discussion meetings to explore the layered stories of the Alamo. I'm pleased to present this meeting's topic, the history of unfree labor at and around the Alamo. This discussion looks at how slavery and unfree labor shaped events in Texas leading up to and after the Battle of the Alamo. We were proud to host this discussion at the Carver Community Cultural Center, which has served as an important gathering place for cultural exchange and performance arts over 75 years. The impacts of slavery touch several moments in the Alamo's history, including the Battle of 1836. Some of the defenders were slaveholders and some of their slaves even fought or were present at the battle. Individuals such as Joe, Travis's slave, shared his story of the events, which is the foundation for what we know today. The impacts of racism and social inequalities are broader than just the history of slavery at the Alamo. The Spanish caste system, indentured servitude, and forced labor all have taken place here. These stories provide context through time for events in Alamo history. Viewing the history of inequality around the Alamo gives us perspective on the motivations of historical figures during specific events, some motivated by freedom for all and others by freedom for some. We can see how their motivations and decisions influence events during their own time and into the future. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Araneta Pierce, Tri-Chair of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee. On behalf of my fellow Tri-Chairs, Rebecca Villagran and Sue Ann Pemberton, welcome. I'd also like to have you recognize the chairperson of the Alamo Management Committee, and also a member of the Alamo Trust Board. We're so proud to have her here tonight, Hope Andrade. Okay. I'd also like to recognize the Alamo Trust Executive Director, Kate Rogers, and the Assistant City Manager, Laurie Houston. Our interpretive and museum consultants from PGAV Des Destinations and Gallagher and Associates are also here to listen. This is our fourth content discussion meeting of the summer. Tonight, we will be learning about the history of unfree labor at and around the Alamo. As a reminder, the schedule of meetings is available on the city's website and the agendas are posted. The next meeting will be on Tuesday, July 27th, and it is called Fort Alamo. It will be live streamed on the city's YouTube channel at 5.30 p.m. I'm proud to say that we're at the Carver Cultural Center. The Carver Cultural Center is, uh, was built in 1929. It has been a library, and it is a meeting place, weddings, funerals, community activities, and it is also has been a library. So most some of the most famous names in African American entertainment have performed in the main building at the Carver, and we are proud that this is our location for our discussion tonight. While I am not a native Texan, I got here as soon as I could. Actually, I came here as a newlywed in 1964. My new husband was beginning a medical residency at Brook General Hospital at Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And I was fortunate, even right out of college, to be hired as a teacher in the San Antonio Independent School District, where I taught for three years at Riley Junior High School, which is now Martin Luther King Academy. Conditional to my hiring, I was required by SAISD to take a college-level course in Texas history. The course was, as it turns out, greatly inadequate in substance and pertinent information. In my role as a responsible citizen of my beloved San Antonio, I have for the last five decades volunteered in over 30 organ 40 organizations 
boards, and institutions in San Antonio nationally and in August and in Austin as a gubernatorial appointee as a commissioner for the Texas Commission on the Arts. Therein, I have used every opportunity to elevate the possibilities, the respect, the inclusion, and the self-esteem of African Americans and all people of color. It is not easy for me to admit that it would take me almost 35 years to learn that the historical legacy of Texas was steeped in the institution of chattel slavery, just as it was practiced in other southern states and that the Alamo had played a role in this history. I believe strongly in the old adage, when you know better, you do better. The story of slavery of my ancestors is horrific and inhumane, yet it existed legally for over three centuries in the United States. Additionally, there is momentous fallout and a substantial listing of collateral inequities that survive from the institution of slavery that continue to marginalize the treatment of African Americans, i.e. voting rights maybe. But today's decisions are made on our watch and on our ability to be inclusive. We can do better. Tonight, we will hear from three exceptional scholars from three outstanding Texas universities about this legacy. May we listen, learn, question, and investigate the message. My wise friend, Maya Angelou, who used to love to come and visit us here in San Antonio, had his many famous sayings. I share one with you tonight. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Now, one of my committee members, Sharon Aguillan, will introduce the first two speakers. Bios for our speakers were sent out in advance, so I hope you've had an opportunity to review them. But a few highlights. Dr. Amy Porter is a professor of history at Texas A&M University, San Antonio, where she teaches classes on early America and Texas. Her research focuses on women in the Spanish borderlands. She is an award-winning author and is currently co-authoring a textbook entitled The Mexican American History of Texas and Beyond. Tonight, she joins us to speak on the Spanish caste system and Native American laborers. Welcome. Dr. Andrew Torget is a historian of 19th century North America at the University of North Texas, where he holds the University Distinguished Teaching Professorship. He is an award-winning speaker and author and has been featured at Harvard, Stanford, Rice, Duke, Johns Hopkins, and the Library of Congress. Tonight, he joins us to discuss the role and influence of slavery in the Texas Revolution. Welcome. First, we will hear from Alyssa Simmons with PGAV Destinations about how tonight's discussion aligns with the vision and guiding principles created by this committee. Tonight's discussion will take a deeper look into a lesser known area of Alamo history, unfree labor. We are using the term unfree labor to describe this topic because it encompasses the many labor systems and groups who were forced to labor and were usually unable to change their circumstances. Globally, unfree labor has existed for centuries through conquest and warfare, and as European powers colonized the New World, they brought those ideas with them, creating systems of agriculture and other labor forces dependent upon unfree laborers. Different labor systems forced Native Americans, Africans, and Europeans into unfree labor in North America, both in the European colonies and in the independent nations that followed. Relevant to the history of the Alamo and surrounding area, tonight's discussion will focus on a few types of unfree labor and the inequalities that came with them. Revealing more of this lesser known history of unfree labor at and around the Alamo will help us to embrace the continuum of history to foster understanding and healing 
as stated in the guiding principles. Bringing to light and acknowledging that history that happened at the Alamo, even if it is difficult, is the first step towards fostering healing. Helping those who might not know the full history will enable them to understand the past in ways that will encourage empathy and compassion. We can take the first steps towards, the, towards that tonight as we listen and reflect on the discussions to follow. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Porter. Thank you. And thank you all for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, these are uh, important topics, and I'm happy to mm -hmm. kick us off this evening. So I'm going to begin my comments this evening with a focus on Spanish Texas, and actually a little bit broader at the very beginning as we take a look at New Spain, and then I will focus in a little bit more specifically on the San Antonio area as well as Spanish Texas more broadly. There we go. Let's take a look at this first image here. I want to start off by thinking about race and ethnicity and the roles that they played in this story. Um, they're certainly going to be connected to these systems of unfree labor. Race and ethnicity were important components of a person's place in colonial Spanish society. In the center of New Spain, and I'm thinking about Mexico primarily here. Um, if we think of Mexico as the core and Texas as a frontier area, we're going to see some differences in experiences between that core and that frontier area. So in the center of New Spain, concern over racial mixing and enlightenment trends to scientifically, and I'm doing air quotes around scientifically here, categorize as much as possible led to the commissioning in the early 18th century of what are known as Casta paintings. And y'all might be familiar with some of these images that I'm going to show here. Several Mexican artists, and we know their names, as well as some anonymous artists, painted these. The paintings show combinations of different ethnic pairings, and they name these new, and again, I'm putting quotes around that, ethnicities or races. At the top of this hierarchy, so if you start at the left and look at the top there, you would have um, the people who have the most European blood. So the Spanish people would be there. And as you move through the hierarchy, what you will see as you move towards the bottom, the bottom right, the people who have more African blood or indigenous and or indigenous blood. Um, the names of some of these, I'm not going to go through every single category here. Some of the names um, could be interpreted as insulting. You also get cues about social class and people's place in society based upon their dress or sometimes the activities that are being depicted in these paintings here. So let's take a look. I've, what we've done is focused in on just a few of the specific panels so we can see them in a little bit more detail. Um, the first panel here depicts this scenario, if you will. Um, Espanol and, uh, and an Indian, India, it says Espanol con India. Um, their child would be a mestizo. Okay, so this is one of the um, categories that we're going to see here, and that would be important in New Spain as well as Spanish Texas. Here are three other examples here. First, you'll see... Um, Mestizo and a Espanol, or Spanish woman, if they have a child, the child would be called a Castizo. And then Castizo and um, an Espanol or a Spanish woman, the child would be Espanol. So what you're seeing here is this idea that there's a possibility of having some indigenous blood, but then if that offspring marries a Spanish person and they have a child, there is enough Spanish blood to be considered Spanish again. Sort of an interesting concept there. And then the last one um, depicts a Espanol, a Spanish person, and a person of African descent having a child who is a mulatto. And these are just some of the examples. This is an image from a different artist. So, so these vary, you know, the, the, the categories tend to be the same, but the depictions might be just a little bit different. Um, this is one which shows an Indian and a, a mestizo woman who have a child, and the child was called a coyote. 
So these are some examples to, to give you an idea about these Costa paintings. Um, I think they give us the impression that race and ethnicity are really strict categories and that they're really important in the lives of people in society in New Spain um, as well as in Spanish Texas. Uh, but one of the things we see is that by the end of the 18th century, there was much blurring of these categories, as you can imagine. And then if we look further north, if we look at Spanish Texas, if we look at San Fernando de Bejar, which would later become San Antonio, or settlements in East Texas, such as Los Adias, race and ethnicity are certainly important, but they're also flexible categories. Um, in most documents, people in Spanish Texas were listed as Espanol or Spanish, Mestizo, um, Indio or Indian, um, Black or Mulatto. Some were listed as Coyote. That's a category that you might see at times. Uh, but the other categories depicted in these Costa paintings really aren't used much in Spanish Texas. It seems that the, the priest, for example, who might be recording somebody's ethnicity at birth or at marriage or at death, um, how are they getting this information? Maybe they're looking at the person and trying to guess based on what they look like, which takes away the scientific from this. Maybe they're asking the person. Um, but what we find in documents is that sometimes these categories change. So you find somebody who might be listed as one ethnicity in a certain document, and another one, they're of a different ethnicity, which tells us that these, these categories are um, fairly flexible here. Another example that's interesting, if you look at the census documents of soldiers at the uh, Presidio in, in San Antonio, they're all listed as Spanish. That's their ethnicity, and it's highly unlikely that they were all Spanish. Okay. So that gives you an idea of um, the Costas and this idea that they could be very defined and extremely um, important, and they cer certainly were for the elite, but also that there's flexibility to this system, and we see that even more so in Spanish Texas. Now, those... Um, those ethnic designations, those racial designations, will also connect to these concepts of slavery and unfree labor. So let me step back again and start big and then get more specific. Um, New Spain had several systems of unfree labor. One was called encomienda. In this system, Indians in Mexico worked for encomenderos, or Spaniards who were given a piece of land with Indian labor attached to it um, so the Indians worked for the encomenderos. Sometimes they had tribute obligations too, so they might have to give them corn or other items of value. And the reci reciprocity in the system was that the encomenderos were supposed to protect the Indians and provide them with Christian instruction. Um, this was an exploitative system of forced labor. Um, one thing I, I have to acknowledge here, of course, is that mortality rates were extremely high amongst the indigenous population. The diseases were just devastating. Um, and there were also complaints from members of Spanish society, most famously, and I have an image of his book here, um, Bartolome de las Casas. And as a result of some of these complaints, um, the Spanish monarchs will will institute some new laws that are known as the New Laws of 1542 that moved to outlaw Indian slavery, as well as encomienda. Um, big loophole here, though. Indians who waged war against the Spanish could be enslaved. So encomienda was now out officially, although the enforcement was uneven. A new system called repartimiento was instituted. And all that did was really take the control of the labor away from encomenderos and place it under the control of the crown. So still there is much exploitation going on here. At that same time, the Spanish are importing slaves from Africa. So African slave labor becomes important. If we're talking about Mexico, um, especially in silver mines, and then certainly in or, th or throughout the Spanish empire um, in the Caribbean, uh, in, in other parts, African slavery would be extremely important as a, as a labor source. These labor systems, though, were not used in Spanish Texas. When I say these, I should say um, African slavery was, but encomienda was not, repartimiento was not. Um, if we look at the early settlements, 
starting in the late 1600s in East Texas or around 1718 in the San Antonio area, um, you have a very different situation. You have the, the missionaries who arrive as well as presidial soldiers who are working with Indians and they, they build the missions, they do the work, the, the ranching, the agriculture at the missions, but this certainly isn't encomienda. And if y'all wanna have a discussion la later about how we sort of define you know, the type of labor taking place at the missions, we certainly can. As the community grew and the, the Via of San Fernando de Bejar in particular was established, new systems of unfree labor became more common. There were some African slaves in Spanish taxes, but not large numbers. Wills and census documents reveal their presence. Uh, my colleague at AM San Antonio, Francis Galan, notes in an article that he wrote from 1743 to 1820, there were just over 30 slave sale contracts. Those are surviving documents, and this is an example of one here from the Bear Archives. He also noted that slaves in Spanish Texas never made up more than 5% of the population, and the height, the population at its height in Spanish Texas was maybe around 4,000 in the early 1800s to give you an idea of numbers there. Um, most of the slaves in Spanish Texas were domestic servants. Some of the slaves achieved freedom through self-purchase or someone else bought their freedom, and some owners freed slaves. Um, this isn't to say this is any, you know, a kinder type of slavery by any means. Um, it, it's just explaining the conditions of slavery in this time and place. There are some records that in, uh, illustrate owners abusing slaves as well. So what the documents do show is that slavery was not deeply entrenched in, in Spanish taxes, um, mostly because there's not necessarily the need for labor. The economies in Spanish taxes were not well developed, and the people, the, the Bejareños, for example, didn't have a lot of money. So for many of them, you know, buying slaves wasn't even a possibility. And this document here, I have some baptismal records on the next few slides I'm gonna show. Um, this is from the 1700s and it shows children who are born to slaves being baptized. So this is another place where we can identify some of these people, find their names and, and bring their names into the historical record. Now, what did become more common was Indian servitude. By the mid-1700s, the Comanches had become the foremost power in the region. They were part of a major captive trade network. Comanches and other plains Indians raided one another as well as Spanish settlements and they took captives. Spanish settlers would pay a ransom, or they called it a rescate, to rescue the captives who were mostly women and children. These people would be brought into Spanish households. They were called criados from the Spanish verb criar, to raise. Um, and, and they worked as, as servants, and they received um, Christian instruction in these households. Generally, they're not held by Spanish families for life. When they become adults, or they've been there for a while, um, they marry, they start their own households, they become Spanish citizens, um, though there's a good chance many of them were relegated to you know, the, the lower um, ranks of society and, and had to continue to work as domestic servants. These people are very hard to trace in the historical record. The baptismal records provide the most insight. We can see many children noted as Apaches or Comanches when they're being baptized. Often it's as their parents are unknown, or the entry might note that someone in the community rescued the child. And you can see some examples here from the 18th century. Those dates at the top, they correspond to each record. I pulled different shots of, of records from um, the baptismal books. The first one is interesting because you see that the godmother is Maria the captive or la cautiva. So there's the sense that there's a, um, a captive community within San Antonio. And this slide shows some more examples. The criados were tremendously important in bringing Indian culture into Spanish households, especially through food as the criados worked in the kitchens, the, the women, the criadas in particular. Um, it's important to remember though, the women in particular are really vulnerable to sexual assault. Um, 
course, these cases are very hard, again, to find in the historical record, but there are fairly large numbers of Indian women having children baptized, and the entries note that the father is not known, and you see some examples here. I would theorize that some of these could be the result of sexual assaults. I mean, of course, we can't say that definitively, um, but it's certainly a, a possibility. On free labor was a part of colonial Spanish Texas history. There were slaves. Um, there were criados as well, who were not free, at least for part of their lives. Um, the number of slaves is quite small if you compare it to other areas of the Spanish Empire. The number of criados, I think, was larger, but very difficult to determine those numbers. Uh, there is one case in the historical record of an Indian woman who said she was held as a slave, and she files a complaint. And the officials in the proceedings um, determine that she was being held illegally, that Indian slavery was illegal under Spanish law, and she was freed. So there is some protection um, that we see being offered within the Spanish laws and within the system, but there is also this, this history of exploitation here. And Indian servitude would persist for, for a long time uh, in the area. And I'll go ahead and end my comments there and pass the floor to another. Thank you. Good to see all of you this evening. So I'm Andrew Torgett. I'm gonna be speaking on slavery and the Texas Revolution. And what I'm going to be talking about is setting a broad scene about how slavery developed in the region during the 1820s and 1830s and the legacies that come out of the revolution itself. So if we talk about the Alamo, we talk about the Texas Revolution, we really need to set this sort of broad schema to understand how all of those things affected Texas in the 1820s and 1830s. And the place to start with that really is the cotton revolution that changes all of North America and really the Atlantic world starting in the 18 teens and going forward from there, all right? So if you really want to understand the, the role of slavery in the Texas Revolution, you actually have to begin in London, England, which I know is a weird place to begin, but we're gonna have to pull the camera back a little ways to get a broad sense of what's going on. So if you lived in the 19th century, you lived in a British world. All right, the British were basically everything that the United States has been since World War II, the most powerful economic, political, and military force in the world. And the reason the British were all those things in the 19th century is because of their massive economic power. They had a huge trade network all over the world that was based on their navy. And what they traded in almost more than anything else that was the base of so much of their wealth was uh, textiles of all sorts. This is really the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution, if you guys remember that from eighth grade history. Um, these machines that would take all kinds of fibers and turn them into cloth that could be sold all around the world brought massive amounts of wealth to the British Empire. And for a long time, what they fed those machines was wool. I'm wearing a wool suit. Right? This is uh, something that they made a lot of money on, but the problem was they could only get so much wool from Scottish sheep at any one time. And as their market expanded, they wanted to expand their capacity for producing textiles. So they started to transition the late 1700s and the early 1800s to a new fiber, which we all know is cotton. All right? And the cotton had a huge number of advantages. It was light, it was durable, um, you could print things on it, which you could make it very fashionable. I think most of us are wearing cotton this evening because it is a very comfortable cloth. But they could scale it up. That was the real idea. You could grow as much cotton as you could get land for. And so the British, in 1815, put out a call. This is the end of the um, War of 1812. They put out a call for cotton all around the world. They'll pay top dollar, top pound, I guess and they'll pay it to anyone who can provide them cotton. And what that produces is one of the most consequential migrations in all of American history that will profoundly affect Texas. So what you see here on this map are people pouring into the Mississippi River Valley, the areas that become Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, um, starting around 1815, going forward to 1820 from there. And the reason people are pouring down in this region, all the arrows you guys see um, are people going basically up and down rivers, which are the highways of the 19th century is that they want to grow cotton in these hot regions along the Gulf Coast, because it's a great place to grow cotton. You've got great soils, you've got a hot season, so you don't have frost that will kill your crop. And best of all, you have New Orleans, which was established the same year as San Antonio in 1718, right there as an international port. And so this is your goal right here if you're moving into this territory. You to grow cotton in one of these factories in the field, because if you can pick that cotton, you can clean it and bale it and put it in those 450-pound blocks you guys see on that wagon right there. 
You see that steamship in the back? All right, that goes down to New Orleans. Steamships had just been invented. And that'll go down to New Orleans, and if you can fill the hull of a ship with those bales of cotton, you can literally make a boatload of money sending that to Liverpool, England. All right? You can make an enormous profit doing so. So people pour in by the tens and then hundreds of thousands of people. All right? Now, not everybody's coming voluntarily. And this is the epicenter of slavery moving its way westward. 40% um, of all the people who are coming down to Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana during this time period are enslaved men, women, and children who are being brought to be the labor system that makes those plantations profitable. Why were they doing this? Why were the masters doing this? Because it was incredibly profitable. Every slave you could put into the fields to work in your fields would mean 8 to 10 more acres in cultivation. That means 8 to 10 more bales of cotton. So if you buy a slave, that person will pay for themselves within the first year, make you a profit, and from then forward will just exponentially increase the amount of money that you can make. Math-wise, it was very simple. And so people poured in by massive numbers. You guys can see right here. By 1820, in Louisiana, you've got 153,000 people, 75,000 in Mississippi, and about 144,000 in Alabama. You add all that up, that's about 370,000 people, more than a third of a million, most of whom have come down to this region within just five years. Think about that. All right? During that time, the United States went from producing virtually no cotton on the global scale to surpassing India in 1820 as the global's foremost producer of cotton, supplying 85% of all the cotton that was going to the British Empire. All right. Now, why does that matter for us? Because all those people, that third of a million, have just jutted up against the Mexican border, or what will be the Mexican border when they become free of Spain in 1821. All right. It brought enormous amounts of wealth to Texas, but on the other side of the Sabine River, you can see there's about 3,000 um, non-Indians, um, Spaniards loyal to the Spanish government, and the power dynamic there is pretty, pretty profound. But what's even more important there is that there's devastation going on in Texas at the exact same time during the 18-teens. Right? The Mexican War for Independence brought an enormous amount of violence to Texas here to San Antonio in the aftermath of the Gutierrez McGee expedition and the guy named Jose Joaquin de Arredondo, who led an expedition here to reclaim Texas and killed an enormous number of people. More than that, by the late 18-teens, when the cotton revolution is taking over the southern United States, Comanches and Apaches are raiding San Antonio and La Bahia, later to be named, renamed Goliad in 1828, and, and wreaking devastation, basically, on places like San Antonio. So much so that by the time you get to 1820, all right, the Tejanos who live here in San Antonio are contemplating abandoning San Antonio. Things have fallen to a horrific situation. San Antonio on the map there, La Bahia in particular, being raided into the ground. And so, and we know that they were thinking about abandoning it because the governor in San Antonio in 1820, a man named Antonio Martinez, wrote letters to Mexico City, the viceroy, saying, we're done. We cannot survive here. We have to, we have to survive for ourselves and we may have to abandon Texas. That's important to understand that perspective. This is Jose Antonio Navarro, all right, who was in San Antonio at the time. And understanding that perspective is important because that's the moment when Moses Austin rides into San Antonio on December 23rd, 1820. And I grew up mostly in Houston. When I took seventh grade Texas history, we started the story with Moses Austin and his ride into Texas. And it seemed like he was just going into wilderness and nothingness. But the truth is he's riding into a landscape that has a deep and powerful history. And he's going there to ask the Tejanos for the opportunity to bring in Americans to come into the region. Right? His son Stephen succeeds him when Moses dies. But what are the Austins promising? What are the guys, what are they offering the Tejanos here in San Antonio? What they're offering is to bring in the cotton frontier. Okay? What they're offering is to bring Mississippi into Mexico. And so what they're saying is, we'll bring farmers. We'll bring 300 families. All right? They'll grow cotton. They'll grow sugar, too. But what they'll grow are agricultural products that will develop the economy of the region. We'll have new settlers here. This will be good for you. It's good for the Americans because they need land. And land's gotten really expensive in the United States after the Panic of 1819. So we need to bring in more people, if at all possible. We'd like to bring them here. All right? And they make no bones about the fact that slavery will accompany them. Because if you're bringing Mississippi to Mexico, and Austin says this in his letters, we've got to be able to compete with Mississippi. And there they allow the enslavement of blacks, is how he puts it in his letters. So we've got to be able to do the same. 
when they're making this proposal to the Spanish, there's no real problem there because slavery was legal under the Spanish Empire, and so nobody really blanched at that one um, at the outset. In fact, for the Tejanos in San Antonio, when, they make, when the Austins make this proposal, it sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty decent. Because what do they need? They need people. They need non-Comanches and non-Apaches to be in the territory because they're being raided into the ground. And they need anybody, essentially, to come into the region to help develop the territory. The Americans maybe wouldn't be their first choice, but it's the least bad option on the table for them. All right? But more than that, the Tejanos have a lot of experience with the Cotton Revolution in the United States. San Antonio is not far from Louisiana. And for many of the families who are in power in San Antonio, and among the elite, amongst the Tejanos, the way they make their living, besides ranching, is to go to places like New Orleans and buy goods to trade in northern New Spain, soon to be northern Mexico. All right? So Tejanos would often go to New Orleans and get goods to bring back in to trade. What do they see in New Orleans? the epicenter of the cotton economy just going gangbusters. They see all the cotton bales being loaded onto ships. They see all the money that it's bringing in. They see the prosperity and the development and all those things. And so they want that for themselves because Texas and San Antonio in particular has had none of that up until now. They also saw slavery firsthand in Louisiana. All right? They were familiar with it. They had seen it and they knew it was the labor system that drove what was going on in the Mississippi River Valley. If that's the means it takes to bring in the American colonists and to bring in the cotton economy, then the Tejanos say, well, we're going to support that. So what I want to emphasize to you guys is that the way slavery, chattel slavery from the United States comes into Texas, it's an alliance between Anglos and Tejanos to bring in cotton farmers and to bring Mississippi into Mexico and to develop that into the territory because for both parties, they're going to get something out of this that they want and they need. They can't do this without the other. And so um, they're, they're making an alliance, they come together, and they're going to need each other because Mexico, at this exact moment, Stephen F. Austin rides into Texas in July 1821. He rides into San Antonio, where we are right now, just as news arrives that Mexico has become independent of Spain. All right? So the question is, what is Mexico going to do with the Austin colony, with bringing in Americans, and with the issue of slavery? So Mexico, after trying out uh, an emperorship with a guy named Iturbide. Mexico decides to write a constitution for a federal republic. They call for a constitutional convention in Mexico City in 1823. All parts of Mexico send representatives. San Antonio here sends Erasmo Seguin down to Mexico City to help write a new constitution. And they gather in the House of Deputies in Mexico City to discuss what kind of country and government structure they should have. Austin goes down there because he's worried. And he wants to know if slavery is going to be allowed, if the colonists are going to be allowed to come in. And what he finds is that bringing Americans into Texas turns out to not be controversial amongst most Mexicans across most of Mexico. All right? Most of them recognize that having colonization here would help them deal with what they called the Indian problem. But what turned out to be controversial was the labor system that Austin and his colonists proposed to bring into Texas, because Austin was very clear about how this had to work. And so, it was the issue of slavery that they ended up fighting about. Most Mexicans across most of Mexico at their moment of independence wanted to outlaw slavery. All right? And there's three reasons for that, which sound very similar to the things that bedeviled the founders of the United States at their moment of independence as well. First, they just fought a war for independence and liberty and freedom for themselves, and it sounds really contradictory to then endorse slavery. All right? We were talking about the rights of man, and now we're going to deny them to some people. And that meant a lot to some Mexican um, revolutionaries who would help fight for independence. The second reason is something that Dr. Porter talked about, which is that African chattel slavery was not a big part of the Mexican economy in almost any state by 1821. Mexico had imported large numbers of enslaved Africans in the 15 and 1600s, but they'd moved much more toward um, Indian labor of various sorts very much unfree labor in some cases in the mines. Um, and so they, they could give up African chattel slavery in the rest of Mexico without giving up much. All right? But the third reason is the most important, which is that Mexico is an independent nation now. And what do they need in order to survive? International friends. And who is the biggest, most important nation in the entire world at this time? Great Britain. All right? And who happens to own the vast majority of Mexican debt at this time? Great Britain. And who happens to be the leading anti-slavery nation at this time as well? 
Great Britain, who was trying to shut down the international slave trade. So it's the one country that the Mexican nation cannot afford to uh, upset. So most Mexicans agreed we need to get rid of slavery. The only contrary voice is coming from Texas. It's coming from Anglos and it's coming from Tejanos who are saying, well, hold on now. We need slavery to get colonization going and then all the stability that it's going to bring. And Austin said this a thousand different ways. If you go through his papers, you can see it all kinds of different ways. This is, I think, is the most succinct way he ever said it. He's talking about it during the constitutional debates in 1824. The primary product that will elevate us from poverty is cotton, and we cannot do this without the help of slaves. Erasmus Seguin, who, since we're talking about the Alamo, son will be in the Alamo during the first part of the siege. Um, Erasmo, in, in talking to a guy named Baron de Bastrop, says, tell Austin, I am well aware that the abolition of slaves will hinder immigration. And it's Erasmo who's actually making these arguments down in Mexico City to keep things legal. Austin and the Tejanos are both saying, we don't like slavery, but we got to keep it legal if you're going to settle Texas. If you don't settle Texas, all of Mexico is going to be at risk, and we have to shore up this part of Texas. Let's just do it temporarily, maybe. We'll do it in the short term. And so what ends up happening is that when Mexico writes its national constitution in 1824, it says nothing about slavery, but that's on purpose, all right? Because this is a federal document, and what it says is everything named in this document is something that the national government of Mexico in Mexico City will be responsible for. If it's not named in this document, whose job is it? It's the states to decide what to do about things, all right? And so slavery was made an issue for the states to decide by not mentioning it in the Constitution of 1824. That was very much on purpose. And the thinking is very simple. That way, every state across Mexico will outlaw slavery. Every state. And they can tell the British, we've outlawed slavery everywhere, except for this one particular strange corner of Mexico where slavery will persist for at least a little while. All right? And so in Texas, um, both Anglos and Tejanos were very excited about the Constitution of 1824 because of the power that it gave the individual states to decide matters for themselves. And that will be a theme through the Texas Revolution. But the problem, of course, is the legacy of the failures of the Spanish to settle the region is that Texas doesn't have enough people to be an independent state. All right? So Texas, this is something Erasmus Seguin fought against in Mexico City, but Texas gets attached to its much more populated southwestern neighbor, Coila, making the awkwardly named state of Coila, Texas. And so Texas is not in charge of itself. It is a part of Coila. And so all those debates about Texas and its future and everything under the Constitution of 1824 have not been decided. They've simply been kicked down the road to the state legislature in Saltillo, which you guys can see on the map is very far from the rest of Tex from Texas and, and the rest of the state. So in Saltillo, they pick up the same arguments again when they write their constitution for the state. And when they put their state constitution together, it turns out, which by the way, was published in Spanish and English. It's the only state constitution in all of Mexico that was published bilingually in recognition of the fact that Anglos in Texas need to be able to read it and the rest of uh, the population in Coila, Texas spoke Spanish. When the constitution was written, it turned out most Coelans wanted to outlaw slavery just as much as people across the rest of Mexico. All right? but. The Tejanos and Anglos once again said, you can't do that or you'll ruin everything and that's not in our interest for stability and economic progress. So the Coelans came up with what they determined was kind of a compromise. Article 13 of the state constitution of Texas and Coela from 1827 says, and you guys can read it from yourselves, but what it basically says is this, all slaves currently in Texas that are being brought over to Austin's colony which I want to emphasize for you guys, is not an inconsiderable number of people. As early as 1825, a full quarter of Austin's colony was enslaved. You're bringing Mississippi to Mexico. That's what's happening in his colony. So what they're saying in this article is that we're going to outlaw slavery really slowly. All slaves currently in Texas will remain slaves for the rest of their lives. In fact, the Coelans said, we'll give you six more months to the Anglos. You can bring in as many slaves from New Orleans as you want. Load up. Every one of those people will remain slaves for the rest of their lives as well, all right? No one will be freed except the children of those slaves. So freedom's gonna take a generation, is what the Coelans are expecting here, and they think this is a, a really good sort of compromise measure because they're not gonna free anybody right away, and it'll be a lot of time to figure all of this stuff out, all right? In the short term, you know, the, the enslaved can still be brought from New Orleans for at least six more months. But this doesn't look like a, a small compromise to Anglos and Tejanos in Texas. This looks like a giant crisis to them, which I know sounds a little weird. But the reason is, in six more months, Austin 
And the Tejanos realize nobody else is going to come from Mississippi or Alabama. If they can't bring their enslaved laborers with them, they're not going to abandon them in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and come. In six more months, migration will end. That will end the colonies. That will end all of this. And this is a crisis. So Austin called a special meeting in his colony in San Felipe. And he brought around all the colonists to decide what should we do about this. And what he decided was we're going to try to get a law passed in Saltillo that says that, follow me here for a second, that says that any contract you sign in the United States will be legal in Mexico. That really, sounds really simple, right? And it has to. It sounds, has to sound really benign if it's going to get through the state legislature. What are they going to do with that? They're going to call slavery contract labor and do it that way. So the idea is that if you have slaves, you're coming into Texas, you'll stop at the Louisiana border and you'll free your slaves. But in exchange for this freedom, your slaves will be happy to sign a 99-year service contract to learn the mysteries of agriculture or the mysteries of domestic service. They used uh, English common law language for their contracts, right? It's a ruse, but it gives us a sense of just how strongly they were attached to the idea that you have to have this labor system if you're going to have the cotton economy. And here's the thing. Austin can't get that passed. The Anglos are not the representatives in the state legislature. It is the Tejanos who represent Texas. Specifically, Jose Antonio Navarro is one of two representatives at this time in Saltillo. So Austin sends this proposal to, Salt to San Antonio, to where we are right now. And the Tejanos get it and they say, it's a great idea. Should have thought of that ourselves. Fantastic. And Navarro goes to Saltillo, takes this proposal, and he gets it passed as Decree 56. And, and Navarro knows what he's doing. <laughs> Navarro writes a letter immediately afterward to Austin saying, I, we got it done. Go do what you need to do. And so Austin then starts sending fill-in-the-blank contracts to the United States that get printed in New Orleans newspapers under the title, and I am not kidding here, here's how to avoid the laws against slavery in Mexico. Do the following. All right? And again, how long is a legal loophole like this going to hold up a labor system and a whole economy in a region? Not very long. They're just trying to buy time. Right? It's like when one of my students says, I'm really sick, I need about three more days to do my paper. They're just extending the deadline and trying to hope that something's going to change in the short term. All right? But the reality is this, um, this raised alarm bells across Mexico very quickly because most of these um, slaveholders are coming to Texas are coming through New Orleans because they have to get contracts notarized and New Orleans is the best place to do it. Well, it turns out the Mexican consul in New Orleans, was his office was right across the street from the biggest notary public office in New Orleans. And he saw what was happening, and he started writing alarmed letters to Mexico City and to Monterrey, where the regional um, commander was. And so word gets down to Mexico City, gets to Saltillo, gets to Monterrey, that the Anglos here are circumventing our laws, and this is a big problem. This combined with other concerns, this combined with the Fredonian Rebellion, which is only 13 guys, I want to remind everybody, raising alarm bells across all of Texas. This is combined with Manuel de Miritaran's inspection tour of Texas and writing back saying, we're losing the region because there's a lot of Anglos here who aren't following our laws. And Tehran wrote a lot about slavery, by the way. And between all of that, um, in Mexico City, they decide we need to do something, all right? And so they pass the law of April 6th, 1830, where they decide to cut off further American immigration into Mexico. And this is the first step of Mexico City trying to reassert control in places like Texas. All right? And really, it's one of the big first steps towards the Texas Revolution as a result. It sets off alarm bells amongst Anglos. It sets off alarm bells amongst Tejanos, both of whom vociferously are against this. All right? And it starts these conflicts. And it might have worked. They might have been able to seal off the border and stop further American immigration into Mexico, except something happens that we never talk about at this exact same moment that helps further push Americans into Mexico, which is there's another cotton boom that starts in 1830. All right? Remember I told you guys in 1815 the price of cotton doubles overnight? Well, it stays pretty high through the 18-teens, levels off in the 1820s, real good levels. And then in 1830, it just goes to the roof. All right, be like oil today going to $250 a barrel. It just is astronomically high prices, 30, 40 year highs. It's amazing, which means that Texas lands are now more valuable than they've ever been, and Americans are much more interested in getting cotton lands in Texas. Laws be damned. And so there's a massive migration into Texas from the United States. 
1830, you've got about 10,000 folks. In 1835, you have 21,000. It more than doubles in the five-year period. During the exact same moment that Mexico City is trying to reassert control in the region. You want to talk about sources of conflicts. This is an epicenter for so much of what happens later. Velasco, uh, Anahuac, all these resolutions, these pu pushing for separate statehood, a lot of these things come back to this moment right here. All right? There's a lot of enslaved people being brought in at the exact same time as well. All right? And while all that's going on in Mexico City, there's an increasing sense that we're losing, we being Mexico, are losing control, not just of Texas, we're losing control of Yucatan, we're losing control of New, uh, New Mexico, California, we're losing control of all these different places. And we need to do something before the wheels come off everything. And so, while well, Mexico had hoped after the Constitution of 1824 was passed that they would have a period of prosperity and development like the United States had enjoyed, it really had been the opposite for most of Mexico. A lot of chaos, a lot of political instability, and a lot of debt. And so there's a lot of leaders in Mexico City who by 1835 say, you know what we need to do? We need to bring back authority. We need a strong man's presence in Mexico City to get the reins back and get control back. That's what allows Santa Ana, who was president at the time, to lead a coup that overthrows the Constitution of 1824. Now, we like to point to Santa Ana as the boogeyman in all of this period, for he's the blame for absolutely everything, and I'm not here to defend Santa Ana as a wonderful human being. All right? But I will say, he is not the only person who thinks they should centralize authority in Mexico City. He's the leader who has to depend on a large cadre of people in Mexico City who think this is a good idea. All right? So he's the figurehead in many ways of what happens. But they do overthrow the Constitution of 1824. When they do that, all the state legislatures are abolished. Every state in, in Mexico is now a department, and it answers to Mexico City. There's no representation, there are no rights, there are no abilities for places like Texas to determine their own things. All right? This begins a civil war in Mexico. This is a crucial context point for the Texas Revolution that so often gets lost, is that what happens in Texas is not it's not just Texas. Yucatan rebels, Zacatecas rebels, lots of places rebels. As Federalists who want to keep the Constitution of 1824 are now against Santa Ana and the Centralists in Mexico City. This is the key context for the Texas Revolution. This is the spark that brings it to bear. All right? There is no immediate threat to slavery directly like there is in the American Civil War that seems to pretend the beginning of the Texas Revolution. It is the overthrow of the Constitution. It is about federalism and all those pieces right there. All right? The fight at Gonzales on October 2nd, 1835, begins the actual fighting in Texas. Something else we don't talk about very much. Most Texans are actually very divided amongst themselves about what they're fighting for and all that. One thing they do agree is they are fighting against Santa Ana. They are fighting against the Centralists. And so when we talk about this period, I, I want to emphasize, you have Anglos and Tejanos, that same alliance that brought Anglo immigration into Texas in the 1820s and 30s, that had fought to preserve slavery and therefore the cotton economy this entire time, is what is opposing Santa Ana and his army in Texas. Right? Now, some of the Anglos wanted independence. Almost all the Tejanos wanted to restore the Constitution of 1824. There are ongoing debates about both of those things. But I will emphasize this. They both, both of them, believed in federalism. They both believed in the Constitution of 1824. What's important to understand, and this is what gets confusing and often lost because it's complex. We want very simple answers to these questions. But slavery is fundamental to how they think about federalism. Federalism promises that you'll be able to develop the region on your terms by being your independent state. You'll have the right to make those decisions. By 1835, slavery is a fundamental part of how both Anglos and Tejanos feel they want to defend the development and therefore the cotton economy in Texas. So when they say federalism, it's not just slavery, but slavery is a fundamental part of that for them because it's about self-determination of the region for how they want to develop the economy, and they've been denied that this entire time. All right? Now, when Santa Ana came into Texas, uh, and he invades in you know, January, February, 1836, when Santa Ana comes into Texas, he's well aware, well briefed on the uh, issue of slavery within Texas. He does not come to liberate the slaves. He comes to reclaim the territory. He comes to put out this rebellion. That is his goal. That is his purpose. All right? But while he's here, he does recognize that a lot of the importation of enslaved people was extra legal at very best. And so there's this famous letter he writes to um, his minister of war, uh, Jose Ma Maria Tornel, in Mexico City saying, 
there are slaves who've been brought here illegally. They should not be groaning in chains because the laws here should, be, should mean that they are free. So that was on his mind, and that was part of the debates during the revolution is what's going to happen to slavery, what's going to happen to the colonies that have been founded on cotton and all those pieces. That's all very much in the mix. All right? And when you get to the Alamo, when you get to the Alamo itself, slavery is infused in this place and in this battle because it's in the middle of all of these things that have been swirling around Texas throughout this entire revolutionary period, okay? And I, the, the best figure for talking about slavery at the Alamo, I think, is Joe, the enslaved servant of William Barrett Travis, right? He's the one that we often talk about. He's one of the better documented folks. He wasn't the only enslaved African-American in the Alamo complex. There were several others, at least. Um, but we know much more about uh, Joe than we do a lot of other folks. So I want to tell you his story really briefly to give you a sense of the way that slavery was enwrapped and infused in all these different pieces, right? So Joe was likely born in Kentucky, probably around 1815. He lived in Missouri. He'd been brought down to Louisiana. He was brought into Texas in 1832 by a guy named Isaac Mansfield, who had purchased him and brought him into Texas and he was brought in with one of those phony contracts, right? When I said Decree 56 and those bogus contracts about indentured servitude, that's how Joe was brought into Texas. And he's brought in with that as a legal ruse, but the reality he lived in the ground, on the ground in Texas was a slave, as he would have been in Louisiana or Mississippi. How do we know this? Because he is bought and sold just like a slave would have been in Mississippi, right? Yeah, Mansfield wasn't very good with money, apparently, and ended up in huge debt. So he tries to sell uh, Joe. Joe runs away. Joe is recaptured. Joe is then auctioned off. And then Joe is finally sold to William Barrett Travis in early 1835. And when he sold to Travis, Travis, who's a lawyer, you know, he's not running a cotton plantation, but he's got some decent money. He wanted a body servant. And so Joe served the role of a body servant for William Barrett Travis. And so when Travis is sent to San Antonio and ends up in the Alamo during the siege, Joe's right there with him. And I want to emphasize to you guys, everything about the story of the Alamo, the 13 days of bombardment that these people endured, the, the, the horrific weather, this terror about whether or not they're going to get reinforced, everything that went on, Joe experienced and saw firsthand, and he was doing it right by the side of his master, the commander, after Bowie is, is basically incapacitated, uh, as Travis, who's all of 26, 27 years old at the time, it's astounding how young this man is, um, is experiencing all of that in the Alamo complex, right? So the terror of all of that is something Joe endures, along with several other enslaved people within the complex. And so he is sleeping in the, the quarters that William Barrett Travis had on the morning of March 6, 1836. And when you know, the shouts come up from the wall that the Santa Ana's army is attacking the Alamo itself, Travis jumps up, grabs his double-barreled shotgun, yells at Joe to wake up, tells him to grab a rifle, and they both come running out into the, into the plaza right there, all right, and come running towards the north wall. And Joe follows, and we know this because this is his account, Joe follows Travis up to the north wall, gets up at the top there, Travis leans over the wall, fires both barrels of his shotgun, and is immediately shot in the head, falls backwards. And then Joe has a choice. He could shoot with his rifle into the oncoming uh, army, or he could head back to, to, where, he, to where he came from and bar um, barrack himself up, and that's what he does. He leaves, he comes back, he barracks himself in, and he hears and sees all of this slaughter that goes on for the next hour in the Alamo courtyard. And he's terrified, all right? He's, he says he sticks his rifle out of a window port and fires a few times. But at the end, he's basically trying to survive. And at the end of the carnage, uh, a Mexican officer yells out, are there any Negroes here? And Joe says back, here is one, and he emerges from the doorway, and then he's almost killed immediately. A Mexican soldier, who's pretty jittery after the fight, shoots at him, grazes one side. Another lunges at him with a bayonet and grazes his other side before a Mexican officer beats them both off with a, with a sword. And then Joe is captured, and he's made to identify some bodies, Travis and uh, Bowie specifically, Santa Ana comes in, he's presented with Santa Ana, who Joe later described as looking like, quote, a Methodist preacher, which is my favorite description of Santa Ana. And then Joe doesn't know what his fate is going to be. Every male in, this, in the complex had been killed up until that point, including a few who'd survived the combat itself. He's taken out of the complex. He is brought back to San Antonio with Susanna Dickinson and some of the Tejana survivors and children who are all brought to the home of Ramon Musquiz. And 
they're all presented with Santa Ana. They're all interviewed by Santa Ana. Um, Joe watches Santa Ana's troops march on parade. He sees all of these things. We're not sure what happens to him, how he gets out from there. If he's paroled, if he's just turned loose, he's not seen as a strategically important person to Santa Ana and the Mexican army. But he leaves, and then he heads east. He doesn't head south. He doesn't head west. He heads east back towards the colonies along the Gonzales Road. He gets about five miles out of town, and he runs. You know, he's, he's there when Susanna Dickinson is heading back past him and heading towards Gonzales with news of the defeat of the Alamo and taking that to, ultimately, Sam Houston, who will, meet, who will, see, who will see them in, in Gonzales and get news of the fight. What happens to Joe after that is he retreats with the army, all right? And he is brought to uh, Jared Gross's plantation, where he's interviewed by the Texas government. He's then sent uh, down to near Harrisburg, and he's re-enslaved. Right? He is property. He is, his master is dead, but his master has a will, and his master has a son. And so he is going to be inherited by the Travis estate, and is going to be managed by a guy named John Jones for the temporary time being. And so for the next year, Joe is hired out, and he's supposed to make money for the estate. And on April 21st, 1836, Joe decides he's done being enslaved. 1837. So that is the anniversary, the one-year anniversary of the victory at San Jacinto. Joe decides, and he picks that particular date, to run away. And this is the ad that is placed a month later for him. I'll give you guys a couple highlights. On the night of April 21st, as everyone else is celebrating Texas independence, by the way, all right, a Negro man named Joe he ran away, belonging to the succession of the late William Barrett Travis, who took with him a Mexican which I believe is a Mexican POW from San Jacinto, which I just want to point out, that's, that's a remarkable pairing if they're both running away to freedom together, um, with two horses, saddles, and bridles. And this, is a, this is our best description of, of Joe at this time. He's about 25 years of age, very young, 5 feet, 10 or 11 inches, very black and good countenance. $40 will be given to Joe, and of course, the small bay horse, which is we want all the property back if we can possibly have it. So Joe runs, and, and, and Joe is not recaptured. But I want to end with something about the legacies of the revolution and, and something that, that Joe would have been running from, which is when Texas becomes independent in 1836, it becomes a republic for nine whole years, as we like to remind the rest of the country on a regular basis. Um, Texas emerges as something I don't think we've recognized as a nation very well. Texas emerges in 1836 as a whole new country dedicated to growing cotton, all right? That's everything the Confederacy wanted to be. But the Confederacy doesn't get a chance to try out that idea because the Confederates lose their war in 1865. Texas gets a chance to try this for nine whole years, and if they're going to be a cotton nation, they're going to protect slavery like no other nation in North America ever has. And how do we know this? Because they said it. They said it in their constitution. All right, you read the Constitution of the Republic of Texas. A lot of it's a pretty quick copy of the U.S. Constitution, but there's some differences. And the most important one is Section 9 of General Provisions, which says very clearly that African Americans are going to be enslaved in Texas, and that will be forever. Slavery can never end. No one can end it. The president can't outlaw it. The Congress can't outlaw it. Nobody can challenge it. You, as a slaveholder, cannot free your own slaves unless you throw them out of the Republic of Texas forever. Why did they do this? Because they were dedicated to cotton, and this was their chance to build iron walls around the labor system that would support that. And so Texas emerges as a slaveholders' republic. And the enslaved population of Texas will go up by almost 600% in the nine years that come as Americans start flooding in from Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. If you read the section, you can get all the details. But this is something that was written, and I want to emphasize this, during the Texas Revolution. It was, was written after the Declaration of Independence, but during the Revolution itself. It's ratified in, in September of 1836, but it was written during the Revolution itself. All right? It's embedded in these broader ideas and these broader narratives. And so if we want to understand Texas, if we want to understand the Revolution, if we want to understand why these things matter in the broadest of terms, we have to understand why... This issue of slavery is so embedded in all these different issues. To say that slavery mattered during this period is not a simple, easy thing. It's to acknowledge that it has been woven into so many different pieces of these stories in ways that connect things in important and sometimes hard to see, but powerful ways that help us better understand why the Alamo matters, why the revolution matters, and why what happened here in San Antonio in particular hasn't just affected the state of Texas, 
but really has affected all of North America. Thank you. Thank you so much, Drs. Torget, Porter, and Gordon, who will meet in a moment. Uh, our panel discussion now will be moderated by Dr. Carrie Lattimore. Dr. Lattimore was appointed by the Merit of the Citizens Advisory Committee in 2021. He's an Associate Professor of History at Trini Uni Trinity University and teaches the African American Experience, the Civil War and Reconstruction, Free Blacks in America, Black Images in Film, the Old South, and United States history. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carrie Lattimore. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm gonna go quickly, because I know every, all of you, it's been a long day. And so I first have the privilege of introducing to you Dr. Edmund Gordon, um, who will be joining our panel discussion. And I'm gonna give, introduce him quickly, and then I'll um, have a couple of, qu qu I mean, a couple of um, specific questions for Dr. Gordon, and then we'll go into our panel discussion. Dr. Gordon is an Associate Professor of African and African Diaspora Studies and Anthropology, um, at UT. His teaching and research interests include culture and power in the African diaspora, gender studies, critical race theory, race education, and the racial economy of space and resources. Please welcome to the panel Dr. Edmund T. Gordon. And Dr. Gordon, I'm going to start with you first. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the everyday life, what was everyday life like for an enslaved person during the Texas Revolution? I'll do my best. Um, first, I want to show my appreciation for the two previous presenters. Uh, Andrew Torga, in particular, um, is brilliant on these issues, and um, it's really a pleasure to hear, uh, hear what he had to say. And he knows more about slavery in Texas than I do, but I do know something about slavery. Uh, Arnetta Pierce asked me to to talk about or to try to bring slavery to life. But bringing slavery to life is a very difficult thing to do. I struggle with this uh, in my teaching. And so how do you bring to life, first of all, how do you bring to life social death? Uh, and that may not mean much, but I'll try to, to draw that out. How do you bring to life to folks who are uh, living in the current circumstances of the 21st century uh, a set of circumstances that's so alien um, to our everyday experiences? Uh, slavery wasn't just an economic proposition. Enslaved people weren't just out on a bad camping trip with rough sleeping conditions and uh, the food not well cooked uh, or the rain uh, dropping on their heads for a weekend, uh, slavery for the enslaved was a, a whole way of life. And it was a particular kind of whole way of life. Uh, it was a whole way of life uh, as a domestic animal because we're talking about chattel slavery and chattel slavery is about humans owning other humans, except for those who own the other humans, they denied the humanity of those humans, all right? So you have people who are in a situation equivalent to that of your dog or your cat uh, or your cow. You have folks who are living in a state of what we call natal alienation. In other words, there's no relationship, social relationship that the enslaved has that the master is bound to respect, which means relationship to parenthood or other kinds of effective relationships are of no matter to masters. Now masters may sometimes for their own benefit, decided to respect some of those, and some were good masters in relationship to others. But there was nothing that they were really bound to respect. Natal alienation also means that people are completely separated from cultures and social sorts, sort, kinds of social organization that are separate from that of the master society. Right? So you have a situation also of general dishonor. General dishonor meaning that 
slaves occupy or the enslaved occupy the position of the abject. In other words, they are the lowest. We heard a presentation earlier about even in Mexico, uh, the relationship in the system of caste, the lowest positionality in the system of caste was the enslaved, the bozo, the enslaved African, right? So it's a position of, of general dishonor. It's also a position of gratuitous violence. And the gratuitous aspect of this is perhaps the most important aspect of it. It means that violence is enacted for instrumental reasons, right? To force the enslaved to provide the labor for which the enslaved has been purchased, but it goes beyond the instrumental. Gratuitous violence means that violence is enacted as a means of gratification for the enactor. It's part of the aspects of dominance that I think we least like to think about, which is prominent in pornography in which erotic pleasure, not necessarily sexual, but erotic pleasure and stimulation comes from the dominance, the complete dominance of others. This is what enslavement was about. Now, one of the reasons I have a hard time talking about this in relationship or in my classes is because these kinds of discussions tend to completely eliminate the aspect of agency and humanity of the enslaved, right? So talking about the conditions in which enslaved people uh, lived uh, robs us of the knowledge that the enslaved also made their own lives within these contexts because they were human. But it's important to lay this out. It's also important to talk about the kinds of effects that natal alienation, general dishonor, and gratuitous violence had on enslaved people. There's a bodily or physical affect. In other words, the enslaved, if you read the conditions of the slave quarters, or you think about them at all, or you think about the clothing that the enslaved wore, or the food that they generally ate, you're talking about a situation of endless discomfort. In other words, the enslaved are not provided by masters with comforts. That's not what masters and the master and slave relation is supposed to be about. Now, slaves could produce some of their own comforts, but in general, you're talking about a situation of continual discomfort, often hunger, wearing rough clothing, wearing, if you got any shoes, shoes that were ill-fit or rough or hard, general discomfort, slipping, sleeping on a hard pallet, etc. cetera. Um, you're also talking about people who upon whom regular pain, or for whom regular pain was a daily aspect of their lives. You're talking about people who rose at dawn, went to, or came out of the fields, or stopped working uh, at dusk, or sometimes later. Uh, folks who did literally back-breaking labor, if you, uh, the physical anthropologists show us that the skeletal, um, of the skeletal impacts on enslaved people of the kinds of labor that they were in, in, engaged in. Um, so there's regular pain. There's also the pain inflicted in order to be able to coerce labor and obedience out of the enslaved. All right? So these are all things in terms of the body that are suffered. There's also the intellectual or the stiltifying aspects of the denial of intellectual stimulation. You know, as we know, well know, most enslaved people were denied uh, the right to learn to read. Uh, they certainly weren't uh, asked to or encouraged to engage in complex intellectual problem solving. 
they did that on their own, but these were things that were threatening to masters, and so that kind of stimulation, that kind of personal growth was, uh, was denied and was difficult. But most importantly for the enslaved on a daily basis, we're talking about the ways in which people were emotionally and psychologically broken. You've heard of how it is that the African, when the African is brought into a situation of enslavement, had to be broken as a horse needs to be broken. Well, the breaking of people is about breaking of them psychologically and emotionally. It's about creating a permanent situation of traumatic stress. So it's not a disorder. It's the norm for enslaved folks. And so the daily condition of, slave, of the enslaved could be greatly modified by the condition that the enslaved found themselves in. So the situation of an enslaved person in town is different than the situation of a slave person at a large plantation, is different than the slave person on a small farm. These are all different. There were masters, just like some of you folks don't beat your dogs and buy them good food and treat them nice. There are other masters who kick their dogs and all that. There's those kind of changes as well, but the basic condition of the enslaved as a domestic animal, as chattel, as the object of natal alienation, general disorder, and gratuitous violence is what characterizes slavery and what creates the daily conditions of slavery, the condition of the abject. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. Um, I should also say that, are you the, also the founder of the African? Um, diaspora, African and African American diaspora studies at UT. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to add that in there. So, so I've got another question. It's kind of a piggyback off of that, but I want to ask um, Dr. Porter as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the experiences of enslaved men and how and women and how those experiences differ differ because of gender? So this is both for Dr. Porter and for Dr. Gordon. I think it's important when we're talking about these experiences to consider gender and the gendered experiences. Um, for men and women in slavery, of course, there will be some, some similar experiences, but when we're talking about um, family formation, uh, motherhood and, and fatherhood in particular, I think are really important. Dr. Gordon noted how, um, how, how slaves, they formed families and they, they lived in under these really difficult circumstances were really amazingly resilient. Um, but those families could be split up, right? And, and they were in many cases. And in fact, I think um, some of the others might be able to speak to this better than, than I can. But one of the things we see with, um, in the United States with the domestic slave trade, um, once slaves cannot be bought or brought into the United States legally anymore and they're being sold within the United States, um, a lot of times as, as slaves are, are sold west or taken west, um, men would be preferred over women in many cases to do a lot of that work or maybe an initial um, movements west. And as those, as those families are split up, you know, those gendered experiences become really important and you see a lot of families um, on eastern farms or plantations where there's generations of women together but some of the men or some of the sons have been separated. Um, so I think in those ways it's really important. And then, um, you know, thinking about the experiences of, of fathers who don't have the ability in many cases to protect their, their wives or, or their children, um, as, as well as um, mothers who, you know, could be separated from, from babies or, or from young children. And then, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, thinking about... Um, Indian women servants in households and how they could be vulnerable to sexual assault or sexual exploitation. Of course, this would be um, an experience of many slave women as well. And I'll 
pass the floor to Dr. Gordon. Picking up on that last point, there's a book called uh, William and Andrew, help me with this, Boliarts? Boliarts. Boliarts, Texas. Texas, which uh, Andrew actually showed uh, at least one of the illustrations from this book. Bullard is in Texas in the 1840s, um, and he goes to New Orleans. Uh, as Andrew was saying, uh, most of the enslaved people who came to Texas came with their masters from uh, elsewhere in the South. Uh, but when uh, the Anglo population of Texas uh, wanted to buy enslaved people, they did it in New Orleans. And uh, Boliart is actually talking about in the 1840s, so it's after uh, the, the beginning of the Republic. But this is what he says. First of all, just to give you an idea of what I was talking about before in terms of the, um, the chattel nature of slavery, I shall close my observations on New Orleans by a scene at the exchange where slaves were selling by auction. Young quadroon females selling for $250 and $300, elderly females for less, strong boys for 300 to 400, field hands 500 to 600, elderly men 200 to 300. And then he goes on and he says this. The next offered was a young quadroon girl, almost as white as one remarked, quote, unquote, as a Christian, dressed very prettily. She gave herself great airs on being brought to the stand her name was Blanche and merely was described as a good housekeeper. Not a pick you offered, old gentleman, gentlemen. I'm ashamed of you, said the auctioneer good humoredly. An old planter from Apelosis brought her for two, bought her for $200. She appeared to know her fate, that of retiring from, to her, the gay world of New Orleans to a plantation in the wilderness but she has one consolation. She will evade the vices of the capital of the South. This dovetails nicely with what was being said before. For chattel women, the choice of sexual encounter was not a choice. In other words, the inner relationships between white men and black women, enslaved women, was always rape because there was never the possibility of a choice. And if you think about what was being said before about the ways in which that after the end of the African slave trade to the United States, particularly the settling of the cotton lands of the Deep South were done by importing enslaved people from the northern areas of the South, and that the breeding of enslaved people was a big business to feed Texas and Mississippi and Alabama. And much of that breeding, just look at us as an African American people and how varied our phenotypes are, had to do with the rape of black women. I was just going to say, to build on, on what uh, Dr. Porter and Dr. Gordon have been saying, I just want to... Um, Say a couple of quick words about, I teach the rise and fall of the slave south every year at the University of North Texas. And one of the things my students have a very hard time doing is defining slavery. And I think a lot of what we're describing here, I think, is, is beautiful in its horrendousness of what it's describing. The one, and, and the accuracy of just how dehumanizing this whole experience was, the definition I always use with my students is they can sell your children from you. And... I think that encapsulates so much of the violence that is both lived and constantly threatened. There's always the possibility that hangs over your head and vast numbers of enslaved people experience that, that horrific reality every day. When we, to get back to the Texas Revolution, um, I think that it's important to recognize that the system of slavery that comes in is one that's been developed in the Deep South, and so all the violence that you think of with you know, plantations in Mississippi and Alabama is what happens in Texas. 
And the Texas Revolution puts a unique stresses on slavery um, in the region. So one thing that happens during the Revolution is when Santa Ana's army is moving through Texas, enslaved people, when they get the opportunity, run to that army. This will happen during the American Civil War as well, when Union armies march through the American South. They will seize the opportunity for freedom when they get their chance. And so when Urea's forces approached Victoria, there were a number of slaves who ran to Mexican lines hoping for freedom. Um, and to, to get away from their Anglo masters. Their Anglo masters recognized this, and during the runaway scrape, after the fall of the Alamo, and especially after Goliad massacre, and there's this fear because Houston's army's retreating east, like, there's nothing between us and Santa Ana. Masters would herd their slaves, and I use herd advisedly because I think that's how it, you should think of it, toward Louisiana to hide them from the Mexican army and the possibility of freedom, not necessarily because they thought Santa Ana was there to free them, but because the enslaved would take the opportunity to run to somebody else if the chance arose. And so when we have accounts of people during the runaway scrape, there's a woman named Delu Rose who has a wonderful memoir of this. Um, she talks about there were more African Americans than white people at the river crossings because there were so many masters herding their slaves towards Louisiana to keep them um, from being freed by the Mexican army. And during the revolution itself, there was so much chaos that there was an opportunity taken by some people to import enslaved people from Africa. Um, as Dr. Porter pointed out, in 1808, the United States is no longer importing people from Africa, but the African slave trade still existed in Cuba, and James Fannin himself actually landed people from Cuba and brought them into Texas straight from Africa. And so this is constantly swirling within the zeitgeist, and the situation within Texas, that the fact that there's a war going on puts new stresses on the system of slavery and gives, in some cases, opportunities for the enslaved to try to seize freedom. Thank you so much, and I love the fact of humanizing slaves because in many ways in history, we've often dehumanized them and making them just economic structures and beings. And one of the problems with that is we forget that they're individuals who have their lives, their communities, their families, and they're doing the best that they can to uphold those families. Slavery as a social system, and I wanna to talk to um, Dr. Porter about that and to ask her what are some of the social prejudices placed upon those lower in the Spanish caste system? And how did that affect their daily lives? Goodness, there's some contradictions here, and I think you heard it in my comments earlier. In some ways, the, the caste system could be uh, very oppressive for, for individuals um, living in New Spain or in Spanish Texas more particularly. Um, but in other ways, if, if an individual had some wealth, had some property, then those obstacles weren't as great. Um, where we see that, I would say, is probably with marriages, or that's where I would look for it. Um, there are instances of, of people from you know, very different caste, if you will, marrying one another, and it's accepted within society um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, in some ways, you know, marriages are ways to bring different groups of people together in society. Um, but it's also speaking to their broader social and economic status. Um, at the same time, there were some marriages that were denied when the statuses were considered too different or, or too far apart. So I think um, the ways in which it was the most oppressive would be for uh, individuals who were brought in as slaves or as captives and works as servants and did not have the opportunity to, to earn some, some property or some wealth. Um, though there are some cases I think we can find of individuals who, who started with, with almost nothing and were able to, at the end of their lives, have um, you know, a good bit more property. So, you know, I think, I think it's definitely there. I think it's an important part in understanding somebody's status and their place in the community. But at the same time, it's certainly not an impassable barrier for many people in Spanish Texas. Thank you so much. The next question is for um, Professor Torget, and that's, and I know you answered this a little bit in your talk, but could you tell us a little bit more in some kind of strong bullet points, I guess, about how the desire of Anglo settlers to have slaves in Texas affected the events leading up to and the outcome of the Texas Revolution? Okay. That's a loaded That's question. A, that is a loaded question. Um, yeah, it is. So, I mean, I'll just say the, the thing that I think that's worth emphasizing is that one, you know, it is Anglos who are coming in to grow cotton, but it is 
a partnership between them and the Tejanos that is making all of this possible. And so it's more complex than I think we tend to make our stories, and I think therefore more interesting and more useful to understand. In terms of the bullet points on the leading up, I'd say the big thing I always emphasize to my students is that when you think about the 1820s in Texas, there's really only one thing that Texas is fighting about with anybody else in Mexico, and that's over the issue of slavery. It's what they're fighting over in 1824, it's what they're fighting over in 1827. I left out entirely in 1829, the Mexican president of the time, Vicente Guerrero, outlaws slavery across Mexico, and all Texans, I mean Anglos, Antejanos, and actually quite a number of Coelans, say, no, that's a terrible idea, you'll ruin everything, and then they get Texas exempted from the abolition of slavery, which is ironic because it's the only part of Mexico where it was actually going on with any sort of significance. Um, so my point in that is to emphasize, when we think about the revolution, it was sparked by the overthrow of the Constitution of 1824. And it was sparked because Anglos and Tejanos wanted to defend federalism. That's indisputable. But what federalism meant to the Anglos and Tejanos was, amongst other things, protecting the cotton economy and fostering it and keeping slavery legal was the means to do that. And that's why they wrote the, uh, what became the Constitution of the Republic of Texas, putting iron walls around slavery. So if we understand their motivations and thoughts and all that, they're fighting against Santa Ana. They're fighting to restore the Constitution and later for independence. But they're doing it within this larger context of developing this region with this model that has not only seen great success in the Mississippi River Valley, but has been greatly successful for them in their experience. It worked in Texas. Austin, this is going fantastic. The Tejanos see the fruits of this and they want to keep that going. And so they're deeply invested in the development of the region and they have no faith that Mexico City is going to be able to do anything that they think is going to be necessary for developing the region. So all these things are deeply tied together. And I also emphasize to my students, they're not fighting over anything else. They're not getting into arguments about Catholicism because... Most of the Anglos coming in aren't Catholic. They're claiming to be Catholic. No one's enforcing it. It's just understood. Slavery is the thing they end up fighting over, over and over again. And so we need to keep that as a central point, understanding when they think about governance, it's the one thing they've been disputing, the only thing in many cases that they've been disputing throughout most of this period. So this question is for anybody who wants to take it, if everyone wants to take it, but somebody's got to take it. So if no one wants to take it, I'm going to call somebody to take it, but somebody, I'm sure, will take this question. Huh? Well, we can do that, too. I won't take it. But um, it goes to the kinds of labor systems. And so we want to talk, I want to talk a little bit about what kinds of labor systems did governments want and how did that change in Texas as it transitioned from a Spanish colony to a Mexican state to an independent nation and finally as part of the United States? Yeah, so I mean, this is a few hundred years of history here, but um, thinking about the Spanish government, you know, Early in colonization, the Spanish crown is looking to, to become wealthy uh, off of their colonies, um, but they're also looking to spread Christianity. So they're trying to balance these interests that come into conflict, I think, quite a bit. Um, certainly early on, there were, there, the Spanish government um, maybe was a little bit opposed, but not that opposed to effort, uh, to different forms of Indian slavery, but once it was pointed out that this was interfering you know, with efforts to convert Indians to Christianity, there were efforts to change that. Um, the Spanish government also supported um, bringing in African slaves to, to do you know, different types of labor. And in fact, we're gonna see in Spanish Texas that there will be um, edicts coming from the government saying, you know, use African slaves. Um, but it, you have to understand also that a lot of times these government edicts that are coming from the crown, you know, they're being distributed throughout the empire and they're being read because they have to be, or, um, but they're not necessarily enacted because it wasn't practical. There wasn't um, the wealth, as I mentioned before, or those labor needs in Spanish Texas at the time. Uh, so there was certainly support for those systems, those various types of unfree labor, but evaluations of them periodically and changes we see to, to those systems. Yeah, so to build on that, I mean, what happens when Mexico becomes independent is that Mexico gets to decide what it wants, and that's the debate. 
that they're having in Mexico City in 1823 and 24. And if you read the debates, which are fascinating to read, they've been published, you can, you can access them really easily. Um, you know, there's a lot of beautiful language in there about this is our moment to seize liberty and talking about those ideals in many ways similar to what you hear in the American Revolution. Um, but they're also struggling with practical realities. And I think that's one of the challenges that Mexico as a nation deals with is that they inherit the chaos, really, of the aftermath of the Spanish Empire in northern New Spain, and Texas is the epicenter of that. There's actually a commission that's put together in Mexico City saying, let's delineate all our problems in, our, in order. So we deal with the worst problem first, and we'll work our way down. We're broke, we're surrounded by our enemies, the Russians are up in, in uh, California, the Spanish haven't recognized we're independent all that sort of stuff. The top problem they identify when this commission reports in December of 1821 is Texas, underpopulated, leaves us just as exposed as we can be as a nation. We've got to populate the region. So that's the struggle they have, is how else are you going to do that if you don't bring in the Americans? They tried other ideas. They offered land to anybody from central Mexico. Nobody wanted to be neighbors with the Comanches, so they all said no. Right? They offered land to 10,000 Swiss farmers who said, nope, not doing that. So this is, as I said earlier, kind of the, the, the least bad option on the table. And if slavery is a part of that, it gets mixed up in this whole discussion of these larger goals that they have strategically as a nation. But that's what they end up fighting about. Because they have, there's real desire to ab abolish that within Mexico that goes on. And, and Texans struggle against that. And then when the Republic of Texas is born, they try to put iron walls around slavery. What happens as a result of that is that the United the Texas then becomes isolated internationally because when they declare themselves a slaveholders republic, nobody, particularly Great Britain, wants to recognize them. And they can't get loans, they can't get recognition, they, they kind of spin into the floor as a failed state. That's why Texas ultimately gets annexed to the United States. They had no other choice. They were falling apart by 1845. Um, the cotton markets had collapsed after the Panic of 1837. They can't get any loans from anywhere else. They've got pretty much nothing. And here's the irony of all this. At the end of the Republic of Texas period, um, the British decided to offer Texas salvation. They would save the Republic, and they would give protection money to the Republic of Texas so they could survive as a nation if they gave up slavery. You know what the Anglo-Texans said? We can't do it. We won't do it. We won't save the Republic. We'd rather join the United States where we can keep slavery legal. And so they joined the United States as a slave state, and this begins into all kinds of politics in the United States as well. Slavery becomes protected, and so the number of both slaveholders and enslaved in Texas goes to the roof. And then in the 1850s, after annexation, Texas becomes the leading nation, uh, the leading state in our nation that produces cotton, surpasses Mississippi, and we are to this day still the leading producer of cotton in the United States. It's something that we've kept ever since then. And that opens up this whole new world for the enslaved in Texas in the 1850s to possibly run away to Mexico. Because Mexico, in the aftermath of the Texas Revolution, 1837, that's when they finally outlaw slavery permanently, and they do it as a poke in the eye at Texans, because they say very explicitly in there, we're outlawing slavery, except for those rebels in Texas, they don't get any compensation whatsoever if we reclaim them at some point, as we intend to do. So all these things get mixed up in that sort of broader thing that leads ultimately to the U.S.-Mexico War. So let me build on that just a little bit. The, the question really leads us to think about the enslavement of Africans as an economic issue, economic and political issue, and um, I think that's a good way to think about it. But once Texas becomes a state, becomes a slave state, it becomes part of a system that at least, you know, there's a big war that's going to be fought about what the situation of blackness and what the situation of enslavement should be. But by the time we get to the 1850s, there's something else going on besides, actually it happened way before that, but there's something else going on besides the issue of what's the most appropriate organization of labor. This is a, a passage from the Dred Scott decision, uh, which of course is a decision of the Supreme Court of the United States and its interpretation of the Constitution that Texas, after 1845, is sworn to abide by. We think that black people are not included 
and were not intended to be included under the word citizen in the Constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures the citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at the time of America's founding considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges but such as those who held the power and the government might choose to grant them. I think that's a great place to end it. Um, Francisco, I'll allow you to come back, but please give our panelists a round of applause for their great job. Thank you, Dr. Lattimore. I want to once again, on behalf of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, extend our thanks to Dr. Gordon, Dr. Torget, and Dr. Porter. Thank you so much for your service and your great education for all of us this evening. May we give them one last round of applause? And to our viewers at home, uh, we hope you join us again for Fort Alamo. Thank you. On behalf of the Alamo Citizens Advisory Committee, thank you for joining us. The stories of the Alamo are layered and complex. We hope this session has provided some insight and will make your next visit to the Alamo more meaningful. We look forward to continuing these conversations.